Amen. Singers. Amen. Trio. Quartet. Trio. Good to have the girls back. Amen. David sang the praises of the glory of Jehovah. Paul preached that all is lost, save knowing Christ. Little John said he's precious by leaning on his bosom so far.
Amen. Good singing. Glad to have you all here. My goodness, more people in here than we had in months. Uh, we the report of Brother Critchard yesterday. We went to his uh, funeral, and uh, it was well, well done, well received. And so he's up in heaven. He comes off the prayer list. Amen. And uh, it's almost clicheish. Well, he's up there dancing and running around like they said, you know. Well, I don't know everything that's going up there. I know if, if the gospel said something about a party happened when somebody gets saved, I guess I just have to believe that. How many are getting saved every day? Don't know, but it should be a continual party, I would think, somewhere, some way. Somebody's getting in. We appreciate that. Well, this morning, um, you uh, have your Bible uh, turn to Job 42, Job 42, and uh, try to preach a little bit. Um, let me read a couple things here, and one is, uh, a couple of them are from Wesley, and Wesley on the go, it says, John Wesley traveled 250 miles a day for 40 years. He preached 40,000 sermons, produced 400 books, knew 10 languages. At 83, he was annoyed that he could not write more than 15 hours a day without hurting his eyes. And at 86, he was ashamed he could not preach more than twice a day. He complained in the diary that there was an increasing tendency to lie in bed until 5.30 in the morning. See, that's why it's not, sometimes not good to read about these old guys. Then another was on, on his 85th birthday, John Wesley wrote in his diary, and we paraphrase, I find some decay in my memory with regard to names and things lately and past, but not at all with what I had read. 20, 40, or 60 years ago, nor do I feel any weariness. 85. We know Brother Seward be changing these bulbs at 90, and he could try it now, but I wouldn't let him on the ladder. He wouldn't. He's got wisdom not to do it. But uh, what a blessing. And then lastly, how about uh, something from Douglas MacArthur? You know he was a saved man, in case you don't know your history. That's what he says. Nobody grows old by merely living a number of years. People grow old only by uh, deserting their ideals. Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up interest wrinkles the soul. Worry, doubt, self-distrust, fear, and despair. These are the long, long years that bow the head and turn the growing spirit back to dust. Whatever your years, there is in every being a heart, a heart that loves wonder, the undaunted challenge of events, the unfailing childlike appetite for what next, and the joy and the gain of life. You are as young as your faith, as old as your doubt, as young as your self-confidence, as old as your fear, as young as your hope, as old as your despair. Some of these old guys, I'm telling you, these old warriors, these soldiers, even Patton, you read some of the wisdom they got over the years, and you, you concur. Man. All righty. Job will be our text uh, for this morning. We're going to preach on uh, something taken from that. Job 42.17 says this. So Job died, and notice, being old and full of days. So I'm going to preach on old and full. <laughs> old and full. You young people better better listen because you're going to be there pretty soon. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we love and appreciate you. We thank you for your mercy and grace. You know, it does my heart good to see uh, this many in church uh, this morning. And uh, Father, what a blessing. And uh, we thank you for friends. And uh, God, of course, the members of our church, appreciate them. Pray, God, that you be with the, the teens and going to be teens, Father, that they listen uh, to some of the things, Father, to help them out later. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Job 42.17 says, Job died being old and full of days. 
Well, number one, and we're not going to go verse by verse with everything, but I'm just going to uh, put a little synopsis out there on Job. Uh, number one, Job's life. Job's life. And if you, how many read the book of Job? Finally read it, all the chapters. Okay. And uh, Job was a hard-working husband and father. Job led his family in the fear of the Lord. He feared God and eschewed evil. Now the devil knows all those that fear God and hate evil. He does. He really does. God knows. He knows that. God premeditatedly challenged the devil using the life of Job. Now the devil tells us that there was a hedge around him by God. The devil knows about our flesh and what man will do for his own survival. So don't ever est underestimate the devil. And God knows who the devil is. And God knows the power of the devil. And as we're going through this, maybe if you've read it, you understand some of the things that he went through. But in his heart, and what God noticed, it's amazing, is that he really eschewed evil. And he feared God. And uh, two things that will keep you out of trouble, those two things. And so God definitely challenged him when the devil came up there the sons of God and God said devil have you considered my servant Job wow that's why over the years you sort of get a little more reserved thinking about who's going through what for what reason uh, God gave me a message one time on this you know with Job where God initiated it and then we have Jesus Christ talking about Peter saying he was going to be sifted as wheat you know to get the chaff out and then you have in Corinthians about people that are backslidden that get spanked by God. Now, a lot of times we can't, as human beings, you really can't. You can't know for sure, for sure, okay? So that's why we pray for folks. We pray to get right with God or that they understand what God's putting them through or in, in that regard. But most of the times as humans, if we're living right and we're doing right, we compare ourselves with others and we sort of like say we're up a little bit more of a notch here and and there, but the older you get, you start to understand some things because uh, God's not on your schedule and he's not on your judgment. Uh, he's looking at every individual in a certain way that they grow and that he gets the most glory from their life. He's concerned with his glory and uh, he gets us to that place where we start to think like him about his glory and sometimes he uses these things. I used to always think of being sifted you know, the, the only thing left, uh, Brother Gunning, is the junk that's in the sift, right? You shake that thing, shake that thing, and that's it. I was trying to figure out, well, sifted is wheat. Why would he do that? Well, because it shows him. It shows him the junk in his life. Everything good comes out. Everything left is here. And the Holy Ghost gets us like that. When we're sifted as wheat, when God allows that to happen, we sit down somewhere and we think, we say, oh, man. If you were here with the uh, pre uh, teaching this morning, we, we talked a little bit like that. And uh, so anyway, we think about Job. We think about how old he's becoming. And uh, God allowed the devil eventually to do everything except take his life. His friends heard and came to help. And... Uh, what did they do, preacher? Well, they diagnosed him, you know, on past practice. The wisdom they gained from pra past practice. And this wisdom gathered from those that disobeyed God and the end result of God dealing with them. If you ever went through the arguments of his friends, there's a lot of wisdom in there. Now, if he was guilty of something, I mean, it could have been some of those things. But it wasn't. So when you diagnose people, you've got to beware because we really don't know that we know that we know. We can look at something, we can judge them with, with righteous judgment according to scripture, but we gotta watch condemning them. Didn't say you hang around with them and do what they're doing, but I'm saying prayer, because you don't know where that person is at that time in a spiritual walk. As a pastor, you, we, get, we get frustrated. And you can misjudge and you can be overbearing and everything. And, but if the heart's in it, what we want to do is get these people to grow, get over things, and get with it. And uh, sometimes we don't know how to do that right because we're not God. But we preach the book 
you still read the book, you still pray, and you're going to go through some stuff, is what I'm saying. And an older person, guess what, has been through a tremendous amount of stuff that you didn't even get there yet. So it's good to get some godly wisdom on things. So God allowed the devil to eventually do this. Now Job, what happened? Job had lost his family, his wealth, and he was humiliated by sores over his body. We know there are painful boils. Uh, he had a, with a broken heart, and now misjudged by the brethren, his close friends. I mean, we know by reading the scriptures that uh, God checks Job's pride at the first discussion, and, and, and Job is at rock bottom in sackcloth and ashes. Just one little talk from God, no kidding. And it's not just one little talk. If you ever read the conversation, it's one-sided, God's. You know, were you there when this happened, when this happened, when this happened? So, and, and even in thinking about Job and, and, and trying to understand what was going on there, I really can't say perfectly that it was just pride. I don't know what was in Job. I know the, the character reference that God gave the devil was, he feared me. He eschewed evil. And the competition and everything was about getting Job to curse God. But God met Job. And when God meets you, after you're saved, you know it. That Holy Spirit will nail you, I'm telling you, and humble you. And so, you know, listening to your parents, supposed to. Listening to the preacher, people in authority, supposed to. And you can do all those things, and all of a sudden, God wants to talk to you about something. And he'll get you in those quiet moments. And it's good for a Christian. If you know you're saved and that happens, don't freak out. Just say, there's something going on here. I'm like sitting here, and it's like I got this thought going. Well, just, you know, talk to God and say, God, uh, what's going on here? And the stuff will come up. And, and I guarantee you, anything that God puts his finger on, we already know. We already know. It's in there somewhere, and we maybe we took for granted. We didn't take care of whatever we're supposed to take care of, but God will let you know, and it's good for you to experience that. Well, I'm saying that because Job heard God saying, were you there when I, and he started going through the list of stuff, and you know, as soon as he talked, Job was hitting the dirt. It wasn't about waiting until the whole discussion was over and God telling him all these things. But in the book of Job, we know it's also a type of a Jew going through tribulation, and we just know about all this stuff that Job had went through. And we know also that he didn't curse God. And I'm telling you, it is rough. Mm. So we understand that God lovingly takes his servant, cleans him up. And uh, the Lord did. And then he looks at the devil and said, Job's lips did not curse God. And his heart would not curse God. Now, in order for his friends to be at peace with God, how about this? Job had to pray for them. And you know what else at the end? Job's wealth and family was restored. Everybody understand that story now? There's a pattern to that. There's a pattern in all of our lives like that. It proves God cares for us, takes care of us, knows the end from the beginning. What's, what's our part? To believe that. To believe that. What's hard for us to do? Do that. So you got Job's life, and then you got Job's admonition. And it's simple. Live your life fearing God and hating evil. <laughs> Man, pray for your family and even ask God's mercy for them in case they forget to pray for themselves. If you read the book, then you understand that he made sacrifices for his family and it talks about him thinking that they may have forgotten to do that sacrifice, that, that time for their own family. So he did it for them too. And it's amazing that through that, the leader of the, the home did those things, and there was a hedge that was obvious to the devil. Because the devil mentioned it himself. Yeah, you take the hedge away, I can get them. So that protection's there. And, and actually, the first and the oldest book of the Bible is Job. And uh, 
you got to think about these things all the time when you're growing up because you're going to run across a whole lot of evil. You're going to run across a lot of things. And whenever you mess up, it's because you, you, really, when you think about it, you, you don't fear God. Like I said this morning, there's just things in your brain we just do. We forget like God's absent, like he, no way he could understand. We put him in a corner somewhere. No, I'm telling you, it's good to be old and full. It is good to have made it to be old and full. Sometimes it's like a millstone around your neck. You know, you think about an albatross or something. and, and uh, But when you look back, you say, well, thank God I don't have to go through that again. I mean, there's just some things. And then on the other hand, you sit there and say, I'm 21. Why? I don't know. Stuff's going in my brain like, oh, yeah, I'll just get up and do this. We're moving Joe Lee two days ago. I just three pieces of furniture, me and Isaiah move. Next thing you know, my wife comes up and says, oh, what are you doing? I'm just laying on the bed. Next thing you know, I'm waking up at 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm saying, man, what? What? What happened here, man? I got new knees. You know, you're old, man. You're old. Some things you just, just ain't working. Yeah, well, Arnold Schwarzenegger's like 80, and look at him. Yeah, look at him. You know, 24 hours a day working out for his whole life. I didn't get into that. I wanted to expand my mind more. And in doing that, expanded my waistline. Amen. And uh, you can sit down next to older people, you young people, and you can learn. I mean, it used to be people just did that. You used to be looking for a job in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. That they, you go into a job and they put you with somebody experienced. And if you were fortunate, the person liked you. If not, they're going to make it rough on you. They ain't going to help you do nothing right because they're afraid of you, right? But, I mean, as a rule, they would put you with somebody that already did it. As a machinist, uh, they, uh, my earlier years, uh, they would put me in there, and uh, I'd be with a fella, and I'd say, uh, where's your tape? He said, tape. I said, yeah, your tape measure. I got to measure this piece of... And he wouldn't answer me. He wouldn't do nothing with me, Brother Gunny. I'm saying to myself, you know, because I was back in the club days, I'm saying, I'm going to knock the snot out of this sucker, man. I got to have it to measure this. If I'm going to put these out, I got to measure and make sure they're right. And finally, I got the foreman, and, and I says, I asked the guy for a tape measure, and he won't give it to me. He cracked up. He says, son, you ain't no carpenter. You're a machinist. It's a scale. We ain't going to give you no tape. You get a scale here. Okay, I'm thinking of fish now. Scales. He gives me this little metal thing. There's little, real little things. All of them, are almost like a micrometer in a form of a ruler. It's not a ruler. It's a scale. But now if I was a carpenter, and I was getting a job with a carpenter, guess what? You got a scale? What you weighing, boy? Everyone had something. But the only way you learned, somebody experienced had to be there, right? Now, everybody is wrapped in flesh. So everybody, if you're a Christian, you have went through a tremendous amount of things already in your flesh. And young people need to understand that. But us old folks, you can look back and say, well, I don't know if I fought that great of a fight, but I tried to keep my course and there's a crown laid up for me, even to them. And I like that, even to them. So, so far, I think I got one of them. That's a good one. But you can be old and be full of the world, too. And that's the wrong thing. But Job here, in the text, when it said he was old and full, he was. God, out of the abundance of God's mercy and grace, give them all quadruple probably what he had and riches in that give his family back all them kids I mean wow so Job had got to experience everything falsely accused during that time maybe he was second guessing God or whatever he was doing in his heart nobody else knew because he didn't curse God in front of his friends didn't complain to his friends he was trying to use cross examination and rules of that sort with his friends trying to say well hey 
that ain't me. Hey, <laughs> that ain't me. You know? And then all of a sudden you see different things happening. Man, them boils, I don't know if you ever had a boil. Emrods or whatever they call them. Imagine being covered in them. And then him knowing how putrid they are and him taking that piece of a pottery and scraping himself clean. I mean, wow. Just to try to feel better for himself. And then all of a sudden, meeting God. Wow. He experienced all that in his life. And then when God was through with his testing, he blessed him. I guess the, part, the, the, the main part I got out of that and, and Pete, First Peter and a bunch of other things is that a lot of times you don't know whether you're being tested or ch chastened sometimes, but you're supposed to be patient. And all those things, you've got to wait on God. Matter of fact, you'd be patient reading the scripture. It tells you that stuff. What does that mean? That means you may not get it. You may be one of them real hard heads. So don't get impatient with God. I don't care what disease you got. Don't rush yourself. Just calm down. You never want to tell God, well, just give it to me. You know, just, just give it to me. Brother Earl Hughes used to say, he'd pray for tribulation in that. You know, we'd all sit there saying, man, he's, he's an old man of God, and he probably knows some stuff, but, you know, I've never prayed, oh, God, let the tribulation happen in my life so I can get patience. Not wrong, because I want to get it over with. Whoa. You think about that stuff. Man, stuff we got to go through? Man, just learn a little patience? Ah. Amen. Well, that was point number two. <laughs> Preacher was point number three. I don't know if I even put it in here, but uh, it's there. Oh, yeah. How about some scripture accounts of being old? That'd be good. That'd be good. Psalms 92, 14. I'll wait a little bit, and since I already got it typed out, I will move with it. Amen. Psalm 92, 14. I'm trying to help you out here this morning. The Bible says they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Hallelujah. Amen. Fat and flourishing. I think I got that down. And I don't think the fruit means I'm going to go out and pick oranges and junk. So I think it's stuff that I gained from my experiences in life that God's allowed me to have in my life. More grace, more mercy, more understanding, a lot of fruits. And then if you do cross-reference, it could be with people that led the Lord. God's allowed me to see that in old age. In old age. So that's a good verse. Go to Psalms 92. You're right there. Look at verse 15, the next verse. Why is this happening? To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. I mean, you think about that. I mean, old folks that live for God have fruit from God that testifies there is a God. I mean, we cry out to the unbelievers, the holiness of God. I mean, he is upright in our rock of stability. I mean, right now, everybody's going nuts with this stuff. And, and I get caught up with it because I've been doing this for eight years now. I'm looking, noticing when it comes up on my wall, I'm saying, you know, it's, I'm going to have to just stay in Scripture for a while now. I'm going to get off all that political stuff. Because I, I, my whole motivation was trying to get people aware of what's going on. And I'm telling you, you give them references, you give them all this stuff. They don't even share information. They're scared to death. I mean, this stuff come on us with this uh, virus, this flu, and now we're suspect to everything. We're the in injection and what's in the injection. And, and uh, a lot of people are giving and giving over to it anyway. And pretty soon, who knows what's going to happen? In order to have church, you, they have somebody in front of the door say, well, you all got to show your proof. In order to go from here to Ohio, you have to, you know, like in Mexico, have the federalities there, checkpoint Charlie's everywhere. As you go and be checked, you got your card. You say that won't happen. I mean, well, it's, it's starting to work now. And people, Christians, are the ones giving in instead of making a stand. Instead of making a stand, rather than make waves. They comply with everything. Don't even pray, ask God, or nothing. They got to feel a little guilty when they compromise like that, but that's the age that we're in. And believe it or not, 
the old folks that are saved, if you talk to a lot of the old folks that are saved, they care less. I'm talking about this. Yeah, right. Okay. What are you going to do? Threaten me with heaven? And you'll get some of them that have been in and out mental type things, and they're not thinking right. But as a rule, older Christians are saying, you know what? Wait a minute. I just about did everything. You know what I mean? You're going to threaten me going to heaven now? Man, I can't. Nah, I ain't giving up. Neep. So then we try to encourage everybody else under us. But see, they didn't do the old age thing yet. So in their mind, they got goals. Well, I, but I still want to do this. And I still got to do this. And, and, and you know, I got to get married. I got to have kids. I got, I got to do. And, you know, and the, all these things. Nothing wrong with it. That's normal. That's normal for kids. Right? Normal for teenagers. Young adults. Set goals. But if you're a Bible-believing Christian, you want God's purpose for your life first. You want to serve God first. Then through that, he'll let you do just about anything. I mean, people used to make fun of Pat Boone all the time. I, me too. A little funny. I thought he was a fairy for a long time. Here I found out later through President Reagan. So he's a witness. As charismatic, the guy witnessed to people nonstop. Wouldn't do any nakedness in pictures. Wouldn't do this. Wouldn't do that. Oh, yeah, well, I know some deal he made. I'm telling you what. The guy at least told the gospel while I was in there and didn't fall into a bunch of sin. That's what he did. So you're promoting Hollywood. No. I'm saying if God leads you somewhere, well, he won't lead you into politics. Yeah, tell it to Daniel, Joseph, and the bunch in the Bible, okay? God somehow used that. Matter of fact, he put them over people. Don't test God in certain ways. You get older, you start saying, you know, thought I had it figured out. Now I don't know what's happening, but I know God's there. I know I got his book. I know he ain't going to violate the book. So I think I'll just stick right there. That would be the safe place to be. And uh, so if you get to be old, praise the Lord. <laughs> Go to Numbers 32, verse 11. Almost done, Christian. Almost done, guys. Almost done. It's okay. He's probably going to grow up and be a preacher now. He goes, I'll show him. I'll be lighter than that preacher. I'll get with it. Get with it so much that you can play cards on my shirt tail. Amen. Okay, Numbers 32. Numbers 32, look at verse 11. Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Next verse. Save Caleb, the son of... <laughs> Jephana, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. Now the benefit of being old is <laughs> you live longer than many fools have. Many fools have. By faith you please God. By faith you obey God over your feelings. Caleb was in control of his actions. And when they sing that song about give me that mountain and you know him being 80 years old and getting all that. Man, all that started in the wilderness. See, he wasn't 80 years old all the time. Him and Josh went to the land, looked it out under commandment, saw it, saw the prospects, and by faith knew they could get it. Came back, all those dudes, the elders and that stirred up, caused a whole bunch of people to rebel against that idea and not do it. That was the bottom line. Didn't listen to God. And when, when, when God says he, they didn't go into the promised land, it means they were killed. Lots of people died because of their disobedience. But nonetheless, God blessed Caleb. So Caleb is something to think about being old, what he could do and what he did do, what his kids did. You read that in the Bible, how God, because of that, because of his devotion to God, his belief in God, God paved a new way for him. Almost like a new leaf, 80 years old or something. Something, isn't it? Think about how old we are and how we're narrowing down. We've heard about prayer warriors. We heard about people just sitting in a chair passing out tracks, you know, when the weather was okay or in a wheelchair. And they just do it like for an hour or so. Then they go back, heard of them going to the nursing home down here doing that a long time ago. Isaiah used to preach there. We had uh, guys here going here all the time giving, delivering the message. 
people getting saved in there, 80, 90 years old. You know, never heard the real gospel. And uh, so for our church, we're an older church. We've got some youngins, but basically old. So what do you do when you're, you're arthritic and you've got all these different medications and you're just trying to control blood pressure and all these kinds of things? And you got memories. You think about how you blew it. You think about how God blessed you. You think about the mercy of God. Well, are you living? Are you still breathing? Yeah. Well, who put the period on your life? You know, they were reading your life, and they said, this is so-and-so, period. I'm telling you, God gets his omnipotent eraser, and he takes that period off because no man, no man can stop you serving God. God will allow you to serve him if you want to in whatever capacity you're doing. And if everybody was in here is doing at least what they can do, God's pleased. And what we want to do a victory battle is to please them. I don't care. I don't care if you're fat and sassy like me. I mean, bless God, I can pray every now and then. I can pass out a track. I can tell somebody about Jesus. I can do that. And I'll do it. If God, you know, I'm out there. I do it. Try to get conversation. Talk about God. I mean, it's sort of easy. If that's all I can do. If I can do more, maybe God will reveal it to me. And uh, you're here today. There's some things you can do. You don't give up on God. Mm -mm. He's got too many testimonies out there, blind people, deaf people, uh, cancer-ridden people. I mean, where you go visit them, they bless you instead of you blessing them. I mean, we have Brother Suver here as a testimony, 93, and John just turned 93. It's in the home, and uh, me and Richard remember where he couldn't keep two things together. And we went there one day, and, and lo and behold, we started thinking right, talking right the first time he went there. I was saying, I don't know what's going on, man. This guy like night and day. And then now, he's probably doing figures in his head. He ain't stupid. <laughs> and uh, I'm saying to myself, good night. You know what he told me? He said, well, we get out, preacher, uh, in the summer, I'll put those things on the door for you. I'm looking, I'm saying, oh, boy. What happened to you, preacher? Conviction. <laughs> Where did he get that thought? You know what I mean? Just off the wall, laying in a bed, you know. I look, put what things? He goes, you know, them things, you know, tell you how to get saved and stuff. I says, okay, John, next subject. And I went home, I says, my goodness. Now, see, if he was to die that night, Brother Gunning, that motive that he had at the judgment seat, yeah, buddy, that's what gets them jewels. See, that's what he was thinking about. That's what's on his heart. So that's about others and not yourself. Self-service will burn up. The serving others is what we're supposed to do. And I look at this and I say, old and full. Man. And we get there in numbers and we see about Caleb and still going out. And then Isaiah 46, 4. And I'll just read these for sake of time. Isaiah 46, 4. And even to your old age, I am he. And even to whore hairs, while I carry you, I have made, and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. To whom will you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me, that we may be like? Verse 9 to 46, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. None else. I am God, and there is none like me. Verse 10 says of Isaiah 46, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So being old has some dangerous aspects of insecurity and paranoia. I mean, we are never to forget who God is and how he has provided all things uh, for his children. When you go to the context over there in Isaiah, Isaiah's uh, God is warning Israel because they're making these stinking statues and they're, they're, they're just worshiping everything but God. And God's trying to get their brain clicking and said, do you remember who, you know, do you know who I am? Do you remember what I've done for you? Do you even know right now why you're doing this junk? My mercy has kept you? Even though it appalls me? And even though you violated a bunch of commandments doing what you're doing? You're still living? 
talk about God being merciful and just at the same time. Wow. Now, there are many scriptures that speak of old age, and it's our responsibility to seek them out. And for teenagers, they need to seek them out too. Why? Because they're hoping to get that way. <laughs> so they'll prepare that way with scripture. And uh, I'll close with Psalm 71.9. This verse uh, just came on me. I don't know if Richard put it on. I just found it alone somewhere uh, in my office. Psalm 71.9. It's a prayer. The Bible says this, Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. Everybody got that? Psalm 71 9? I mean, that's a sincere prayer. It should be for all of us old folks. We don't want to, we don't want to stop being used to God. We don't want to use our, you know, headaches or body aches or anything as an excuse not to serve God. We know that who God is, and we know that he can give us grace and mercy to do what he wants us to do. If he puts something on your heart, you need to follow through with that. Pray. If you're in our church, we'll pray together. Let's say, preacher, I think God wants me to, let's pray about it. You get peace on that thing, you do it. But there's not a person in here that doesn't know that we have a ministry. Everyone in here. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are reconciling the world onto him. Remember that? Reconciling. Wow, really? Yeah, you got the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. It's our job to tell them. They don't know. And I told you before, tracks are a means to eventually, when you open up your mouth and you feel that liquid gold going through your veins like never before, and it feels like you're in a bubble, and you're talking to a lost person, and you just go through the whole thing, when you're all done, you sit back and you say, well, wow, what just happened? What just happened is God used you, and it felt good. And it was amazingly intellectual because he gave you his wisdom. And it was like you were answering questions from these lost people, just spitting them out, man. And then, whew, imagine doing that a few times a week. It'd be something, wouldn't it? So what do you do, preacher? You pray and ask God for that interaction. And then wait. Being old and full is a blessing. Amen. So what a waste for us to fail at the end in unbelief, in non-service to our Lord. What about the next generation? Consider those that make it to 35, looking seriously at us. <laughs> when you get 35, you'd be looking at older folks. Do you tell folks about your Jesus? Do you give your testimony to your workers, neighbors, and friends? I heard that before. I'm going to keep hearing it. What do old people do <laughs> that are saved and cannot function as they used to? Well... Are we still obligated to live by faith and tell others about Jesus? Sure we are. Can God use old people? And can he answer their prayers for personal revival? Yes, he can. We got to get serious. That's all. If you don't think it's depressing me coming in here and knowing that God's using people that's out of here, I even get mad about that. And that's, ain't that the whole thing? Get people in here. Get them grounded. When God moves them, amen. They move themselves, well, that's between them and God. But I mean, it's supposed to be a blessing to me. And I sat down on my desk, I said, I don't know what's going on. Why, you can't play hockey, preacher. You can't play basketball. You can't, like, jump around with these kids like some of the healthy people do. You know, to, like, you know, generate that electricity and that energy. You know, preacher, you're old. So I told God, I said, well, just give us some old people then with a smittering of young people to keep the old people feeling young. But mainly, make us a conduit for missions. I just think the, the, our country's going to hell. And once we do, them missionaries over there, no more money, no more protection from the government, our government, nothing. They're left out there. And God knows that, and those missionaries know that. But in these last days, man, I'd sure like to drum up a bunch of money to start conduit, you know, from God to us to the mission field. We can't get there, but the time now is at hand. They need it. 
Oh my goodness, are they suffering over there with this? The same thing we're doing over here, over there is like multiplied with this virus. But stuff like that. But see, in order to do that, people got to think, why missions? Well, God so loved the world that he gave. So apparently it starts off with missions. <laughs> apparently if you're saved, you want other people saved, whether you're scared to tell them or not. You ought to want people to save. You don't want them to go to hell. And apparently there's a lot of people out there a distance away that are working in cities and other places that need funds to stay where they're at, to get other people saved. And plus, judgment seat of Christ will look a whole lot better for all of us if we got with the program. Because life is temporary. Blink, we're gone. Right? Only what's done for Christ will last. So when I preach this old and full, I'm doing it with a little bit of experience. And I'm trying to maybe get a message across for the young folks to understand that, like the Bible says, whatsoever we sow it, that shall we also reap. And even by saying that, I understand all the stuff I didn't reap because of the mercy of God. But it doesn't mean I go out and repeat that and do that, presuming upon the mercy of God. What do you do, preacher? Get as close as you can to God right now. In the day and age that we live, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. It's not just a woe is me. It is like worldwide move. Seems like everything right is being overturned. That's so negative. But on the other hand, I listened to some at CPAC or whatever that is, and I was encouraged with something stuff that I heard. And then the Lord says, Well, are you as encouraged about what I say? I said, well, you're running like a second, I think, right now. I got I to gotta hit my head, rattle, rattle. He has the preeminence. So you're here today. If there's anything you need to get right, you just go up to the altar and do it. If you're scared to death, do it in your seat, whatever. Just get right with God if you need to. If you don't, ask him to help you this week. See what he wants you to do. Like I told you before, he gives you abundant life. You can do everything you can do. That you normally do. Just serve God while you're doing it. You old folks, amen. Consider yourself full. Full of stuff. Full of the past. And you're old. So what you going to do about it, right? What you going to do about it? You going to fight or are you just going to give in, give over and turn on the soap operas, man? Do some meds and just sit there and, uh, and drool. Or just get with it. God will give you some energy you know not of. He really will. He'll help you out. Amen. Let's pray.